Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Catching Up with Kakaako. And uh, it's a particularly appropriate uh, in this case because uh, Scott Wilson, uh, who is an architect par excellence, joins us, an, an, an active member then and now of the AIA. Um, and we're going to talk about, first, we're going to talk about his familiarity with Kakaako Makai because he and I, had many engagements over that issue back 20 years ago. So, Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jay. Good to be back. Thank you. So let's uh, let's talk about, uh, I mean, we, we could spend the time with all your awards and achievements, but we don't have the time for that. Suffice to say, you have a lot of them. Uh, and suffice to say, you're very familiar with Kaka Akomaka. You've studied it. You've been part of the urban planning uh, group. Uh, in the AIA Honolulu over that. So the question is, uh, what is the level of your familiarity then and now? Well, it, I was really, uh, I kind of was prodded into this originally because uh, my wife, uh, who was born and raised here in Honolulu, uh, always would tell me, oh, I, what's happening in Kakako? It's, it's horrible. It's making me want to leave the city. Uh, this is the city that she she grew up in, and and uh, uh, I realized there was a lot of apprehension when Kakako was first starting uh, really to get going, even in the 80s and 90s, uh, and the, and the towers started arising. Uh, there was a a, a sense um, amongst a lot of locals that that, that this was this was a, a horrible development, and it, and it just did not seem Hawaiian or even Honolulu. So um, I was chair of the urban design, regional and urban design committee, and I, I commissioned uh, some students up at UH to, to build a model of all of Kakako. And it was like 15 feet by 15 feet. I mean, it, and it was a scale model with all the current buildings, just, and, and it even included the rail line. You know, this, this was uh, the projection. So. So back in those days, I, I started holding um, public meetings where people could listen to the, the designers and the landscape architecture and, and all the professionals that were uh, hired by uh, the city to, to design Kakako. And, and through that, I, I finally realized that it was a very thorough program. It was a, uh, they, had, they had come up with some innovative zoning for for that part of the city, it was really going to be a separate city within Honolulu, and uh, and now you you're seeing it get built out. And um, un unfortunately, Kakako Makai did not receive the same thorough planning that Kakako Mauka did. That's what I discovered. Mm. Uh, you, know, you remind me of uh, uh, a, a visit I made to um, uh, the. The old IBM building then became the Howard Hughes headquarters mm -hmm. back ten years ago or so, and they had a they had a, um, a model of uh, everything they anticipated would happen in Kakaako, and Kakaako was bristling with condos in every yeah. corner of it, and uh, you know it's really interesting how they saw it perhaps differently. Anyway, well, it so it's a special area, isn't it? Can you can you talk about the special quality of Kakaako and thus the special quality of Kakaako Makai? Yeah, that you know from from the documents that I, I reviewed, uh, what what was really clear was that was that the uh, Kakaako Mauka, everything Mauka of of uh, Ala Moana Boulevard was basically going to be high high density residential and commercial mixed use buildings and there were no new parks uh really uh projected to be in that part of Kakako so so it, you know we there's always a rule in urban planning of a, about you know 2 acres of park for every 1000 um 1000 residents and Kakako was projected to have something like 30,000 residents so clearly there there was a there was a uh, something was out of line from an urban planning point of view because there were no new parks. There were little, Mother Waldron Park was a little one, and and there's a, a very small park over in the Howard Hughes uh, area, and and that's it. And so, 
the the understanding was was always that Kakako Makai was basically going to be the the park for Kakako. It, it it had you needed some open space where people could enjoy the views, they could enjoy enjoy the fresh air and the ocean front. And and you know there are thirty thousand of them eventually going to be in Kakako, and they need a place to just just get out of their out of their condo and and walk around. So, can we zoom up a little bit and look at Kakako vis a vis the fact that it's the uh, you know uh, she half a mile quarter mile from downtown, uh, which is, by definition doesn't have a lot of parks, and yeah. which is um, you know business district. And this would be what the the closest residential district, and it would be the closest recreational district too. Um, so, in terms of urban planning, I know you focused on that, you know, uh, for years and years, and and still do now. Uh, where does it, where does Kakaako and Kakaako Makai stand in terms of developing out the center of the city? Well, as you know, if you walk around there, basically Kakaako. Uh, Mauka is developing from either end, from the downtown end with all of the Kamehameha schools uh, properties, and then at the Ala Moana end, the Howard Hughes uh, uh, projects are, are are pushing ahead. And and as you can see, um, it once they once they complete a, a, an area that in this new vision, it it's very high density. There's a your your the streets are. Are are all uh, landscaped and and they have furniture and trees and so forth. But you are looking at towers all around you. Uh, so um, clearly, if you could use the analogy of New York City, you you need a place to get out of those high rises and just enjoy some open air nature. And and the only real option you have is to go to toward the ocean, which happens to coincide. With a you know a long-standing lay of green concept that was supposed to extend all the way from Diamond Head to Aloha Tower, so that that lay of green was the idea was that the, along the ocean front um, there would be open space where anybody you know visitor or tourist alike could could stroll along the ocean front and and enjoy the views up to the mountain. Yeah, so um, at, at one point. Uh... There was a plan uh, for Kaka'ako, especially Kaka'ako Makai. It mm-hmm. was not a plan of HDDA, um, but it was a plan. Can, can you talk yeah. about whether H- HDDA, your knowledge, had a plan and what this other plan was about and, and who did this plan and what it was like? Yeah, I, I, um, and, I and I can't speak to, to, to all the history of HDDA on this, but. Uh, Basically, um, w- there are some major landowners in Kakako Makai, as there are in Kakako Mauka, and um, the because the 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 vision but was always Oha is not the only landowner in Kakako Makai. So that's if, correct. Oha, if the legislature, and Oha... in its wisdom, gives the green light to uh, OHA to build its project, mm-hmm. then it would seem that would like, you know, can't, you can't have special legislation affecting only one party. That would affect right. all the landowners in Kakako Makai. So it wouldn't just be one project. Am I right? That, that's correct. You, 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 couldn't, you couldn't constitutionally allow a special zoning for one set of parcels and, that, and then bar the other parcels Kamehameha Schools owns some very prominent parcels right on Ala Moana Boulevard, uh, and they would they would almost inevitably say, oh, "Well, we want to exercise our 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 development rights here too," and and they would want to put towers on their on their parcels, which would be Kakaako Makai. Yes, right, and 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 so getting back to your other question. Uh, HCDA uh, did not choose to to actively um, Design Kakako Makai, other than just generally setting it aside for public use, because they 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 saw some conflicts with the different landowners in that area, and they um, they just basically kicked the can down the road. And so there were citizen planning advisory council was formed back in the early two thousands, 
And they spent several years having community meetings and deciding what is the vision for Kakako Makai, more and more specifically. We know it's general use, it's a gathering place, it's, it's, a, it's for public amenities. So they, they crafted about a five-page vision for Kakako Makai, and I think that came out in about 2009. And shortly after that, uh, there was a, a planning group from California that was hired to, to then create a master plan, a, a preliminary master plan, a physical plan that, that embodied the principles of, of the vision. So the vision just talks about it as a uh, Kakako Makai as a gathering place, community gathering place, a place to celebrate Hawaiian values and Hawaiian culture. And, and a place to enjoy the Malcolm Mackay views and the oceanfront and the fresh air, you know, uh, basically kind of a park-like principles. And, and so a lot of that, the land that was owned outright by the state was, they did create a gateway, so-called gateway park. And that's the park that you see today. It has a little sliver of land that goes all the way to, to uh, Alamona Boulevard. And then uh, as you, as you head toward the ocean, it fans out and becomes a, a wider parcel all running along the, the very ocean side of, of Kakako Makai. I've so, spent many happy hours in that area myself. And it, yeah, and as you know, it was originally, it was a, a trash site. So they just decided they would put a huge kind of uh, filter and a covering over all that and, and just make a big hill and 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 put a methane vent at the top of it and and it's worked fine what i i remember when it was first opened up it was lovely and uh you know nice little street furniture and lighting and 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 hills grassy hills so this is uh you know what what didn't get completed was some other uh, other state-owned lands more fronting along kiwalo basin that that's kind of really the the rub right now. Mm. So, uh, you know, uh, this this property, this plan you talk about, this this did not include residential, and it did not include high rise, right? That's correct. Yeah, um, I always um, from the start, um, and, and you see it in the principles, the guiding principles of this vision. Uh, it, it it was. For community use. It was for public use. It had museums. It had performance centers. It had Hawaiian uh, culture demonstrations. Uh, it even had a, f a few restaurants uh, facing the Kiwala Basin, uh, obviously like the old Fisherman's Wharf. Um, so uh, there were, you know, the the emphasis always was on sort of open space, maintaining the views. You know, just just a kind of a, as a set of lungs, really, for the high density kakako that that will eventually we will eventually have. That's a great expression. So, um, <laughs> you know, there has been discussion over the years, and it's not just about um, you know the, the toxic aspect of the uh, of, of of the refuse that's buried under the topsoil there. Um, mm -hmm. But in general, we have uh, climate change and sea level rise and all that. Are you familiar with the environmental considerations in building a 40-story uh, uh, condo in that area? Yeah. Well, just, yeah, just theoretically, uh, you know, all of, uh, most of coastal Honolulu is, you know, just a few feet above sea level. And that includes Waikiki, that includes uh, parts of downtown. Uh, and it, and even Kakako Malta, and so if you if you walk along Kamake Street and uh, you know uh, Oahe Street, you you see that the the latest towers that are built are are all raised. They're up on big podiums uh, above the street level, between three and five feet. So so right now our approach has really been to just elevate the buildings. There's technically they they move some of their key electrical equipment up up onto second floors, and and they're basically um, they, those buildings can still function even if the streets are flooded. So this is a this is this is a the, the sort of first kind of pass at, at climate change response. Uh, I don't think it's a great long term 
a solution. I think <clears throat> long term we're we're going to have to manage a very slow retreat from our from our coastlines, and it's going to cost billions of dollars, and it's going to take years and years. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going to have to change the um, the specifications for permitting, right? If, if, in other words, if you if everybody agrees that uh, this is going to be an area where you have uh, sea level rise uh, and issues about flooding, and, mm -hmm. and and exacerbated by the fact that the floods may include toxic materials, um, then you've got to you've got to make <clears throat> requirements for a building permit, and those specifications would be mm -hmm. different than the existing requirements for you know a building permit. Yeah, and, and so if you would have to raise the building, if you have to change the specs mm -hmm. around the building in the pathways mm -hmm. between the building, if you yeah. have to, um, you know, build up the the soil or or raise the level of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the uh, uh, infrastructure around the building, this yeah. this would have to be documented somewhere. Th and this is it, and you have two issues over that. I'd like to ask you about number one. You want to make these profound changes in the building permit requirements that takes time and it takes transparency it takes um a public access to mm -hmm. uh, you know to, to make those changes and the second question sorry to ask you two questions at the same time <laughs> but for the but the architect and the engineer uh, and the developer and the contractor it all means gobs more expensive and thus feasibility is is at issue, and mm -hmm. a unit which costs X dollars in the in the market won't be X dollars anymore. It might be one point five X or two point zero X or three. Right, the, the yeah. cost will be astronomical. Right. Well, yeah, there, there's really two parts to uh, climate change response. As I say, the the first pass at this is just to jack up the buildings because. You know, I mean, uh, you you can't literally raise all the streets. You can't. Th th this is this would be impossible. You know, we we have to. We can't fight sea level rise uh, by literally trying to lift uh, all of coastal Honolulu. That <clears throat> that's just not going to happen. So there would be a colossal infrastructure cost, as you say, to try to raise all the roads, raise all the utilities. Uh, I, it the the more sane and, and physically responsible responses just to literally gradually uh, phase out <clears throat> coastal properties that are that are in immediate danger and, and that are being constantly flooded. And sea level rise is going to take a hundred years. And so I I really think that, you know, Honolulu will change over the next hundred years and, and the the properties very closest to the to the ocean are are just going to gradually have to be abandoned and and rebuilt inland. And you know, fortunately, we're a high island. We have a lot of high ground. We just we just need to gradually move that way. It it it's a profound change in the look of the city. Obviously, it's going to take many generations. So I don't think we need to lose any sleep over uh, over how our city is going to change overnight. It, it's nothing like that. Yeah, but, well, sea level rise is inevitable, and depending on who you talk to, uh, mm -hmm. we'll have a foot or more by 2050. And, and the question then is, when do we begin this process you're talking about? Uh, if it's a leasehold building, say 99 years or 100 years, and, mm -hmm. and the, mm, uh, the problems uh, that will arise, arise long before that lease is over, which is likely, I mean, yeah. inevitably likely. Uh, when do we start working on this? I think I think uh, there have been you know student teams up at the UH uh, Architecture School who have already created new visions uh, for Waikiki for Kakako, uh, but you know the short answer is we we don't want to be building high rises close to to these these areas that are susceptible to to, to sea level rise. Obviously. We've got a downtown that's practically at sea level now, and 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 we we're going to end up being like you know cities in Asia where the, that have a, a rainy season and flood. I mean, if you've ever ever seen pictures of Bangkok in November, you know that basically people are walking on these sort of elevated temporary walkways that are like three feet uh, above the street because 
the streets are flooded for weeks at a time. And so there, there, you can function. You can function, but you, you just need to recognize that long term, you shouldn't be doing things. Um, you know, you shouldn't be starting new projects in areas that you know are going to be subject to flood. Mm. Well, that's the critical point, isn't it? So yeah. taking all this into account, taking the history, uh, taking the expression of um, public sentiment over the citizens group you talked about, which was very broad based, including a lot of Native Hawaiians, mm -hmm. um, taking into account uh, its um, you know urban uh, urban planning aspects, its proximity to down, downtown, the the lack of parkland uh, in 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 Honolulu and in this area. Taking into account the environmental considerations you just described, and uh, the cost considerations, and the and the reorganization of our building permit system, um, what are your thoughts about whether this should happen? I think it it has to happen, Jay. It <laughs> we we can we can't bury you know we can't stick our head in the sand. Um, this this is coming, and and uh, I think. I think Department of Planning uh, for May for the you know the rest of Honolulu and then HCDA. I think HCDA is is very aware of it, and uh, they um, that's why they always earmarked you know uh, Kakako Makai as as a public use area because that way if things get flooded, it's it's not a major calamity. And that you see around the world now uh, a lot of waterfront parks. Are being designed in a way that they can actually flood and then drain out and and they can function you know they can recover very quickly and and i think kakako makai has has exactly that same potential uh and you know frankly at this point nothing has been built so there's you know we, we're not in, a, in, a, in immediate danger because we we've kept that area fairly clear well, let me go back to the you know the initial question is should we be building or permitting the building of 40 story residential projects not one but probably a number of them in kakaako makai that's the question before yeah that. well as i say i i'm and i'm not taking issue with oha per se but they're a state agency they have a mission to provide for their constituents, and and they're certainly absolutely entitled to that, and and uh, um, but in my you know based on the history of the planning of the area, it it, it seems completely incompatible, both from a, a park and an open space point of view, and and from a sea level rise point of view, uh, it seems incompatible to be putting forty story towers in Kakako Makai. Um, are you uh, are you familiar with how other architects and, for that matter, engineers feel about this? I mean, you're you're, you're a fellow who is uh, uh, you know engaged with lots mm -hmm. of architects and probably a lot of engineers. How, yeah. how does the planning, the design and planning community feel about this? Are you the only one who feels this way, or is <laughs> this you generally held? Well, I mean. Architects have to follow laws, and and they have to respect politics. And I mean, don't forget Alexander and Baldwin hired local architects, you know, twenty years ago to to put in a series of residential towers uh, on on lands in that area. And there was a huge public outcry, and um, the the whole project was just shelved. And and I just think, um, you know. Architects are looking. You know, we, we need our work too, uh, and these are potential projects. But uh, they always have to occur within, uh, in respect to, to our laws and and our public sentiment. And uh, um, from a planning point of view, I just I just don't see it um, being compatible at all. Mm. So, um, Chapter three forty three, the Hawaii Environmental Protection Act. Uh, requires an EIS on state land. Um, and um, in the case of Kakako Makai under HCDA, that is state land. Uh, furthermore, OHA, for example, is mm -hmm. a state agency. No question about that. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it would seem to me that um, 
and many others that I've talked to that uh, an EIS, a full-blown EIS would be necessary uh, mm. for uh, any, any uh, uh, permit, any uh, approval of, of the mm. uh, OHA project. So query, mm. what, what in your perception, what would that involve? What are the factors that the EIS would have to take into account? Yeah, I, I mean, I think they have to go right back to fundamental planning principles um, because this is, it's not, we're not talking about traffic impacts or, in, you know, necessarily environmental impacts. We are having to go back to open space and community gathering functions. Uh, so this EIS, I think it would be really pointless. I, I don't think it should ever get to that point, frankly. Uh, I, I think a mo way more interesting question is when in 2021, when the legislature. What do you mean pointless? You well, mean it, it's like we, it's we, it's we a colossal. The, the, we never trigger it because we're not going to do the project. Is that what you mean, pointless? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I just think that's a, it's a huge waste of of research and 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 expertise on a project that should never even come up. That's that's all I'm saying. I, I just think I just think if you if you if you have that kind of effort involved, you should be going back to the original deal between the state and OHA and saying, we need to find another set of parcels of land to give to OHA in exchange for these nine that we were they were given in 2012. Because that was the that was the resolution that was that was uh, brought before the legislature in 2021 because they they were getting so tired of this yearly debate should we do high rises in Mackay or not and 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 there would be public demonstrations and and so the the legislators are just getting drawn into this debate every year and and then it's going to happen again this year and and a far more productive thing would be to say wait a minute, let's go back to the original uh, uh, exchange that, uh, in which OHA got these parcels and let's find them some, some parcels that are, are currently zoned for, for uses that they can actually take advantage of. Because it, it just wasn't fair to, to make this deal with them and then and just give them that somehow this hope and expectation that this land was going to get rezoned and become much more valuable. It's like, it's like it's like handing somebody a big block and saying, "Here, here, this this is ten pounds of uh, copper, but uh, uh, you know, if you can turn it into bronze, it'll be worth three times as much." You know, and that's that's kind of what they what they did to OHA, which was to me uh, grossly unfair because. Puts OHA in a, in a bad light uh, that like oh they're being greedy or something and it it was a it was a a deal that should never have happened in my opinion. Okay, there's so much more I'd like to ask you about honestly. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, any any final thoughts? Uh, if you were standing in front of the uh, legislative committees, you know it's it's funny because this. This is a planning issue, right? It's yeah. an AIA or an architect or an engineer issue. It's not a legislative issue, and yet the legislature is being asked to make these decisions. Uh, <clears throat> it doesn't seem like an appropriate use of legislative time, effort, or authority. Mm -hmm. But that's that's just my view. Um, yeah. So, query: If you're standing in front of a committee in the legislature, mm -hmm. saddled with trying to figure out whether to do, uh, uh, you know, whether to make a plan that would allow this. Uh, what's your advice to them? Well, again, it, it, I go back to their 2021 uh, resolution in which they were going to form a committee to search out other state lands to give to OHA that were, uh, uh, you know, that would satisfy that original 2012 sort of debt that the state owed to OHA as you know, and, and uh, give them in good faith some lands that, that are of the value that they were promised back in 2012. And, and, then, and then 
you know, reclaim those nine parcels in Kakako Makai so that we can we can move ahead with a real real master plan uh, um, that's consistent with Kakako Malka. Yeah, we haven't moved ahead with that. We need to move ahead with that. We need to mm-hmm. have it realize its true destiny. Uh, yeah, it's been, it's been held up by this issue. That's what it seems like to me. Yeah, exactly. Well, Scott, Scott Wilson, uh, did I mention that you were an architect par excellence? Did I mention that? <laughs> I'm, I'm so close to retirement, Jay, that it, it's all, you, you're, it's good that you got a hold of me now because uh, maybe in the future I'll be uh, off, uh, you know, traveling around and I, w- I won't even be available. No, but you'll be thinking about this and so will I, and I'll be yeah. thinking about you. Thank you so much, Scott. You're welcome. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.